All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasper Bors, and I'm the student president of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program at Yale. Excited to welcome all of you to our panel discussion on inflation and the COVID-19 economy. Before I introduce our guests this afternoon, I just want to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We host lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, panel discussions like this one, and an annual conference every year since 2010. Our over 350 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a serious forum to engage meaningfully with conservative thought, the Buckley Program forwards its mission of developing a more representative and more open political atmosphere at a university like Yale. Especially at Yale, where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. I'd also like to recognize the American Enterprise Institute Executive Council Program for their gracious sponsorship of this event. Now on to our guests. Diana Furchgott Roth is an adjunct professor of economics at George Washington University, where she teaches transportation economics. From 2019 to 2021, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology at the U U.S. Department of Transportation. Prior to joining U.S. DOT, Diana was Acting Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the U.S. Department of Treasury. She has been a Senior Fellow and Director of Economics 21 at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research and she previously served as Chief Economist of the U.S. Department of Labor, Chief of Staff to the, of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and Deputy Executive Director of the Domestic Policy Council. Desmond Lackman joined the American Enterprise Institute after serving as a Managing Director and Chief Emerging Market Economic Strategist at Solomon Smith Barney. He previously served as Deputy Director in the International Monetary Fund's Policy Development and Review Department, and was active in staff formulation of IMF policies. Mr. Lachman has written extensively on the global economic crisis um, as, the, as the U.S. housing market bust, the U.S. dollar, and the strains in the euro area. At AEI, Mr. Lachman is focused on the global macroeconomy, global currency issues, and the multilateral lending agencies. Kenneth Rogoff is a professor of economics and the Thomas D. Cabot Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University. From 2001 to 2003, Rogoff served as chief economist at the International Monetary Fund and his widely cited 2009 book, with Carmen Reinhardt, this time is different. Eight centuries of financial folly shows the remarkable quantitative similarities across time and countries in the run-up and the aftermath of severe financial crises. His monthly syndicated column on global economic issues is published in over 50 countries. So we'll begin by having some opening remarks from each of our speakers, and then I'll pose a few questions of my own. Afterwards, we'll have questions from our audience, which you can feel free to submit throughout Q and A um, and the opening remarks of the speakers using the lower panel of the Zoom window. So please join me in welcoming Diana Furchgott Roth, Desmond Lockman, and Kenneth Rogoff virtually to Yale and to the Buckley program. And with that, I'd like to ask Professor Furchgott Roth to open us up. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, the consumer price index, the most common measure of inflation, is now 6.2% on an annualized basis. The producer price index is running at 8.6%. The index of import prices is up 10.7% over a year ago, and the index of export prices is up 18%. These import prices fuel increases in the producer price index. All these indices that began to rise in the spring of 2020 kept going, and new data for November will be released on December 10th. Inflation has been generated by supply shocks and aggregate demand stemming from aggressive monetary and fiscal stimulus. Inflation has accelerated over a widening array of goods and services. Inflation will remain elevated after all the supply disruptions ease. Inflationary expectations are becoming embedded in wage and price setting behavior with escalator clauses showing up in union contracts. On the demand side, Final sales to domestic producers are up over 19% since the second quarter of 2020 decline. Factors driving demand include pent up consumer demand and government subsidized increases in disposable income, a jump in excess personal savings, government fiscal transfer saved, uh, personal savings over 2 trillion higher than pre pandemic. Household net worth is 138 trillion 
which increases the propensity to spend. Business retained earnings soar and cash is at an all time high. On the supply side, we've been discouraging people from working and lockdowns in Asia mean that the flow of goods has been impeded. Well, I'm sure all of you know the data, uh, but the question is, what is the Federal Reserve and the administration going to do about this? There's a difference between the actions of monetary and fiscal policy to deal with inflation. Let's take monetary policy first. The Fed's understatement of the role of monetary policy as a source of inflation is misguided and potentially dangerous. The Fed stops inflation not by talking, but by taking action. But will it take action? On Tuesday, Fed Chairman Jay Powell said that we should put away the term transitory, unquote. He basically admitted that the Fed had been wrong without saying it was wrong. He said that the Fed would have to start tapering, meaning that the Fed would be buying fewer bonds and mortgage-backed securities. But by purchasing some bonds and mortgage-backed securities, even a lower amount than in prior months, the Fed's balance sheet, now at 8.6 trillion, is still growing. The Fed is the largest holder of US treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, and it's not going to unwind those. The federal funds rate is deeply negative in real terms. Nominal rates are still at zero, and there's still strong aggregate demand. Inflation will continue to rise. While the Fed is behind the curve in dealing with inflation, and we're coming up on midterm elections, Fed governors know that they're behind the curve, and now they know that in order to slow inflation, they'll have to raise rates during an election year when they want to get, keep a low profile. So the Fed has a choice of two poor alternatives next year. Will it raise rates going into the midterm election? Or will it do nothing and let inflation continue to climb and get attacked for runaway inflation? This is not the kind of limelight the Fed wants. President Biden also has multiple openings at the Fed and new people coming in, and how the Fed acts and reacts will be changing. Another interesting question is how the Fed's choice will affect the fiscal debate. So now let's look at the fiscal picture. At a time when the economy is in good shape, the infrastructure bill has just given Congress another trillion dollars in budget authority to spend over the next uh, 10 years. And Congress has given this to the executive branch. President Biden is going to try to front run that money by spending as much of it as possible over the next few years. This will continue to put upward pressure on wages and aggregate demand. Studies show that the fiscal multiplier on infrastructure spending is higher than on transfer payments. The infrastructure bill will generate a million new jobs in high paying areas such as construction. So you're going to aggravate the labor shortages. Now Congress is considering the Build Back Better Act, which will add another 1.7 trillion in new entitlements. That bill has passed the House of Representatives, but not the Senate and it needs to pass the Senate to move to the president's desk for signature. With inflation concerns, Build Back Better has a lower chance of passage. Tomorrow, the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases the employment numbers. It's the most important Friday in the month, the first Friday of the month. And on December 10th, we're going to get the next set of inflation numbers. If the employment numbers are better than forecast and inflation continues to pick up, the Build Back Better Act might get slowed down because members of Congress know that it would exacerbate inflation and they have to run for election next year. There are major elements of discord among Democrats about the Build Back Better Act. For example, putting back the state and local tax deduction, which is a big benefit to high income individuals uh, in Democrat states linking the tax benefit for electric vehicles to a union labor requirement. So you get a bigger tax deduction if you buy a Ford than a Toyota. And increasing royalties for leases on oil and gas production on federal property. These are all very divisive among Democrats. With the rise in gasoline prices, some of the most visible and popular price increases in the country 
because people drive past gas stations multiple times a day. The request to OPEC to produce more oil and the decision to open the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, it doesn't make sense to a lot of members to be discouraging oil and gas production here at home. This slowdown is even more likely because a number of pieces, the slowdown in the Build Back Better Act is even more likely because a number of pieces of legislation need to pass over the next week or so to keep the government running. A continuing resolution to keep the government funded needs to pass, as does the National Defense Authorization Act. Also, the debt ceiling has to be raised so the government can go on borrowing. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has stated that the debt ceiling must be raised by December the 15th, and members are supposed to break for Christmas on December 13th. What are the implications of doing Build Back Better next year rather than this year? The delays will give an opportunity for those who don't support Build Back Better to reconsider, and it would lower the inflationary pressures on the economy, on both the demand and the supply side. Inflation obviously has an effect on the president's approval rate and the prospects for Democrats in midterm elections. We're spending trillions of dollars to stimulate the economy without worrying about inflation. Soon we will be looking at an insistence that some of these bills be paid for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fershkot Roth. Um, I'd like to ask Professor Rogoff to uh, take second. Uh, thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic, Diana. I don't know what's left for me to say after everything you covered, but let me start by th thanking uh, Jasper and the William F. Buckley program for hosting this panel uh, and also to Desmond and Diana for joining me. I, uh, before I talk about inflation, I just want to mention I was a Yale undergraduate. I lived in a very different world uh, than you are. Um, I uh, actually, one of my best friends' father was editor of the National Review. I completely disagreed with him about everything, uh, but it was fantastic to uh, have him in my class. And also I was able to go to debates where my friend would say things that I thought were, you know, wrong. I, you know, disagreed with many of the things that he was saying. But uh, I would, it's, it saddens me, you know, if we live in a world where those debates are not possible or where I watched William F. Buckley on firing line. Uh, yes, you know, uh, probably not the whole, everyone he did, I, by no means, but, and I didn't agree with many things he said. But the idea, I wonder if today he could have a show on PBS. Uh, I wonder if he could be a speaker at Yale. I actually don't know his record to know whether he could or couldn't, but uh, that, that I, I think it's, I welcome what the William F. Buckley uh, group. And again, I don't, I don't really know much of what goes on here, but the general principle of, you know, trying to have more voices and stuff, I think is something as a Yale graduate, I'm, you know, glad to have. So anyway, let me, let me turn to the much narrower topic about inflation. Uh, and uh, as I said, Diana just you know, covered the landscape there, but let me, let me make a few points. So one is that the financial markets are curiously calm about this. So uh, one measure we have that we look at uh, about what the financial markets are thinking is there's a, there's a measure, you can look at what, what do people think inflation is going to be five years from now. I won't go into the technical details. Those of you that uh, know already know, and those of you that don't probably don't want to know. But uh, it's like 2.4% the prediction for inflation year six to 10 going out. And if you were to go over the 10-year average of what it was before 2019, it's not that different. And similarly, uh, if you were to look at what the market's predictions of how much the Federal Reserve is going to have to raise interest rates, uh, it's it, very little uh, is what the markets are thinking. So even though it's true that uh, the Chair Powell did a really remarkable reversal on Tuesday, uh, 
he'd been emphasizing inflation's transitory, be patient, it's going to go away. He said, I think we're going to have to stop talking about transitory. And that, that's really quite remarkable. But nevertheless, markets are still sort of drinking the Kool-Aid that uh, he won't have to raise it. The Fed will not have to raise it interest rates very much. I personally think it's much more knife edge like that. And I think Diana explained a lot of the reasons of really what's going on. Uh, I, I still think it's within the realm of possibility that the Fed sort of does uh, what will I describe tightening light, L-I-T-E, uh, and gets away with it and says, we told you so. But I also think there's a chance that they move quite a bit and it doesn't, it's not enough that they waited too long because this isn't just a demand shock, it's a supply shock. We don't understand it completely. There's a lot we don't understand about inflation. So my feeling is that the markets seem rather sanguine about what the risks are here. I think they're pretty, uh, pretty considerable. And uh, you know, in some sense, if you look at the policies that were followed uh, over the last couple of years, not just in the Trump administration and the Biden administration, there was a lot of fighting the last war what do we wish we did during the financial crisis? And let's just do that more. And that, that was certainly a lot of economists uh, supporting that. But this is different because it, there are elements that are more like uh, the 1970s, that's when I was at Yale, uh, where there was a big oil shock you may have learned about. And it's just, when supply is down, it's different than when demand is up. If it's driving the what's the the, the having the prices go up, and so when su supply is down and you raise demand, it just makes inflation go up more. And I think that's that's not so it's not so easy to know what it is, by the way, because when this first hit, a lot of the Keynesian economists, and frankly, I probably am a Keynesian economist, but maybe less extreme, a lot of the Keynesian economists were saying, "Oh, it's a demand shock." there's a little supply effect, but it's basically demand. We need to fill in the demand. It's just like the, just like the financial crisis. And I, I actually wrote a piece at the very outset of this saying, no, 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 it's not. We don't know what it is, but there's a big supply element. So I'm, I'm not sure what to do going forward. I think it's a, they, they're in a difficult situation. Maybe anything they did would be difficult. Let me lastly say that um, I was pleased that uh, President Biden chose to reappoint uh, uh, Jerome Powell as Fed chair against enormous pressures within his own party to appoint, I, I assume, Lael Brainerd, who is superb. I worked with her when she was at Brookings. I was in her section. I've known her uh, much of her career. I think she's great. But I think it would have been, uh, you know, if, not separating the particulars of the two, uh, I think it would have been a terrible signal to the world about the independence of the Federal Reserve. So I, I think, I, actually, this is one we have to give President Biden a lot of credit for uh, standing up. I really think he did stand up to his party and reappointing Powell. Uh, that said, uh, <laughs> certainly, uh, Powell's taken a very soft approach so far, and he's set, given some signals. He may back out of it, but it's not easy when you've let it go this far. Thank you. And Mr. Lockman. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to be on a panel with Diane, Diana and Ken. And I would take a somewhat different approach from Diana and Ken. Uh, I would agree with them totally that part of our inflation problem, a big part of our inflation problem is policy driven. So I don't buy the story. You know, I think that the story that the administration and the Fed have been peddling that the inflation is a question of supply chain problems or energy prices or labor shortages. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. But what the main driver of the inflation in my mind 
is the extraordinarily easy monetary and fiscal policy. So we've got a situation where the gap that we had last year during the pandemic was something like 4% of GDP, but the government took upon itself to increase spending by 25% of GDP over the past two years. You know, this is an enormous amount of money that they've thrown at it, something like $5 trillion, and now they're going to be adding more. Monetary policy, meanwhile, hasn't been paying much attention to the fact that fiscal policy, we've got the biggest budget stimulus in peacetime. What they've done is they've kept monetary policy extraordinarily easy by buying the amount of bonds that Diana mentioned, something like four and a half trillion dollars in a, a space of a year, kept interest rates at zero, let interest rates go very negative in real terms. Monetary conditions have never been easier. So we've got that combination. So I'm just surprised that the inflation hasn't been even stronger with that kind of uh, policy stimulus. Where I differ from Diana and Ken is that I regard as a very important problem that not only have the Federal Reserve created price inflation, what they've done is they've created asset price inflation. So we've got a situation right now, because they've bought all of these bonds, because they've flooded the markets with liquidity, we've got a situation, in my view, where we've got a global everything asset and credit market bubble. So just to give you a few examples, if you look at US equity prices now, equity valuations, if you look by the Schiller measure, we're at levels that we haven't seen. We've seen them once in 100 years. You look at the housing market, housing prices now are higher than they were in 2006, even in inflation adjusted terms, and they're still increasing by 20%. You look at the emerging markets, Countries that have got very poor credit quality have been flooded with money and they've been able to borrow, increase their debt, huge amount at very low interest rates. And the same with bad borrowers in the United States, highly leveraged companies borrowing all of that money. So the Fed is in an incredibly difficult position that if they don't raise interest rates, they're going to get higher price inflation. They're going to be pumping up these asset markets even higher, which means that you get a harder landing down the road. On the other hand, if they raise interest rates, there's a risk that these bubbles burst. So where I'm coming out, uh, I should just mention that there's the minor problem now. We've got a new variant that we really don't know exactly what it's going to be doing. You know, is it just going to be limited to making the supply chain more difficult or is it going to tank the global economy? Are we going to get more lockdowns? But leaving that aside, the way I see it is that we've got a short-term inflation problem, but the fact that we've got asset bubbles and credit market bubbles all over the place that are a lot more pervasive than they were in 2006, 2008, when they were largely confined to the US housing and credit market, once the interest rates rise, one's going to get the deflation of these bubbles. Once we get the deflation of these bubbles, inflation isn't going to be our problem. It's going to be the fallout from asset and credit market bubbles bursting. So that's where I'm seeing the situation. Well, thank you, Mr. Lachman. Um, if if any of you have responses to uh, what the others have said, uh, you're welcome to speak up now. Otherwise, I, I'll pose a few questions of my own. Uh, well, I had a couple of quick responses. Um, sure. To, uh, uh, Ken, the rumor in Washington is that the reason Lael Brainard was not chosen was because Secretary Yellen is only going to serve for two years. And afterwards, Mel Brainerd is going to be made Treasury Secretary. So that's the rumor around here as to why she wasn't chosen uh, instead of um, Chairman Powell. So for whatever that's worth. Uh, and then I'd like to ask Desmond about the global asset bubbles. If you look at US core CPI inflation, uh, it's much higher. It's about uh, you know, almost uh, 5%. It's much lower in the UK, it's somewhat under 4%. Uh, 
in the euro area, it's 2%. And in Japan, it's actually negative 1%. So how do you account for the global bubble with the different inflation rates in the different countries? Or are you saying that they are not measuring adequately these bubbles, that the inflation rates we have are not adequately measuring the bubbles? No, that the bubbles that we've got in the asset price markets aren't really being driven by different levels of inflation in different countries. Rather, what they've been driven by is by the central banks buying the risk-free asset. So what we've seen is we've seen the Federal Reserve, you mentioned, bought something like $5 trillion. Uh, and just to put that into perspective, you know, if you look at what Bernanke did, Bernanke, it took him something like six years to do what the Fed this time around has done in one year. You know, so the pace at which they've been swooping up all of the risk-free assets uh, has been extraordinary. But they've been joined by other central banks, you know, that the ECB has expanded its balance sheet by a similar amount of money. So what it means is you've got all of this liquidity that the investors are stretching for yield. When they stretch for yield, they'll go to high risk places. So you've got a ridiculous situation here. If you look at the emerging markets, you know, that I'm looking at countries like Brazil, or Russia, or South Africa, or Turkey, those countries have managed to be able to borrow, even though their fundamentals have never been worse. And similarly, you know, you get to Italy, that a country that's highly indebted, really got very poor outlook, is able to borrow at a rate that's not very different from Germany and certainly below the US. So what I'm saying is that what's occurred because of the way in which the Fed's gone about monetary policy, going through this quantitative easing problem, what we've got is we've got enormous distortions in prices. You know, that's very dangerous. You know, when you get interest rates that don't reflect the probability of default, then you really set yourself up for real problems in the financial system. What they're doing is they're taking comfort in the fact that the banks this time around are probably in a better position than they were in 2008, you know, to weather a uh, bursting in bubbles. But you've got the whole of the non-financial sector that is non-regulated, uh, you know, the hedge funds, the equity funds, the all of that part of the market. They've got a huge amount of exposure, you know, so when companies begin defaulting, when countries begin defaulting, this isn't going to be uh, this isn't going to be a pretty sight, you know. And I think that that's really where you get the deflationary pressure coming from. Thank you. I just want to add. I mean, Desmond, I lean in your direction for sure relative to where the markets are, and I think I indicated that in my remarks. But you're expressing a confidence of the overvaluation that I'm not sure is warranted. We, I think, we don't know. I just think there's a lot we don't know, and the real. I, I, the real interest rate is sort of the mother of all these problems. I don't think the central banks are driving the real interest rate as much as you're saying. They, uh, I don't think quantitative easing, uh, buying government bonds is really doing all that much. I, the housing, buying mortgage bonds is kind of crazy, but I think that's a sideshow. Uh, I, I, you know, we're seeing this all over the world and it, it's uh, absolutely hard to understand, but I'm, I'm not confident, you know, how it will unfold. I mean, the, the interest rate stayed zero for a very long time in the Great Depression. And, you know, so yes, if they, if they went up quickly and significantly, it would just blow up the world. But I'm not sure that that's, that's a risk, but I'm not sure that's, I'm not quite sure I'm with you that that's like a central scenario, if that's what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I'm not talking about interest rates as much about interest rate spreads. You know, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about very risky borrowers able to. Yeah, borrow. I know. I, I, you know, so I think that that, you know, that when a country, you know, if we just take a specific country, forget about the emerging markets, which, you know, many of them, you know, if I look at a country like Brazil, how Brazil is borrowing debt to GDP ratio close to 100%, inflation 
budget deficit 10%, going into elections, you know, that I don't think I've seen fundamentals so bad, yet the country manages to borrow at reasonably low interest rates. Italy would be even worse, you know, that Italy, here you've got a country, it's never had debt this high, it doesn't grow, it's stuck in a Euro straitjacket, yet it borrows at the same rate as Germany. That makes absolutely no sense at all. You know, so I'm just saying as soon as the risk of trade occurs, we're in trouble. What is making me more nervous this time around is that it's not that we've just got problems in the emerging markets or the highly leveraged debt or the equity market. We've got them everywhere. You know, so when you get the big unwind, uh, I don't see how this works. And I, I think that the reason that I'm fairly confident that the unwind occurs is because we now got inflation. You know, so you've got the Fed has to raise interest rates, you know, because otherwise the inflation is going to take off. They've got no uh, real choice. It's just a question of timing uh, before they've got to slam on the brakes. And I'm just saying that if you've got such mispricing across so many markets, you know, I haven't even mentioned the equity market, you know, that is, uh, we've got we've got a price earnings ratio now that is double the long term average. Yeah, but we have a long term, we, there's been a trend decline in long term real interest rates. So where do you see the Fed funds rate in 12 months? I see that what in, if you ask me in 12 months, I say that what they've got to do is they'll go through another exercise of huge amount of flooding the market with liquidity again. You know, so the way I'll see it is that the markets will correct. You know, you'll have your uh, emerging market debt crisis here and there. You'll have a few corporate failures. You'll have equity prices coming down. That'll be exerting deflationary pressure. The Fed will feel incumbent to make a complete U-turn and to then, you know, because the interest rates are close to zero, there's not a whole lot that they can do there. They'll have, we'll have another round of quantitative easing. You know, this thing just keeps going on. So you mean that during, just before, before the election next summer, we're going to see the effects of the Fed raising rates in the bubble coming down, some of the bubbles popping? I, 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 I would think that well before the election, we're going to see some accidents in the financial markets, you know, that I don't see how this goes on for a year, you know, because you're already seeing trouble, you know, you're already seeing uh, places like Turkey uh, blowing up, you know, you're already seeing, and the Fed hasn't even started, you know, that as soon as they start, they've put themselves in a totally impossible uh, position. Turkey is a known goal. Pardon? Turkey is a bit of an own, go own goal. Right. No, Turkey, I think that, uh, I think Erdogan has just totally lost it. You know, that I don't know how much the currency's got to move, that the currency now is at something like 1350. It was at seven not a little while ago. It's depreciated by around about 40, 50%. And he's still insisting that he wants to keep cutting interest rates. Oh, I'm, I'm now with Joe Stiglitz's, here. sorry, one more. That was Joe Stiglitz's recommendation in his uh, globalization and its discontents when you face an exchange rate crisis. Uh, developing countries should be able to cut interest rates when they have a when they have a crisis. So who knows? I'm not endorsing it. <laughs> well, at least well, there's um, a benefit from the experiment. We'll find out how it works. Looks well, like Jasper's I, I, trying to get in a question. Yeah, I might I might intervene here with a um, an audience question actually because it's it's on the topic of of kind of how can the Fed get out of this this cycle here. So this audience member asks, well, he says history is clear that elected officials don't get reelected when they try to fight inflation, but it's less clear about whether they have trouble getting reelected if they don't fight inflation and just let future prices and wages rise in tandem. Given this, the 21st century's trends towards progressivism. What do, what do our panelists see as the risk? The Fed will merely claim that it's fighting inflation, but do considerably little in response to inflation, potentially for years on end. And whoever would like to go first is, is, is welcome to. Well, well I'd, I'd say, say very hard. I, I would say the first thing the Fed should do is stop buying treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities, not just talk about tapering, but uh, stop purchasing them and then gradually 
wind down its uh, uh, portfolio, its balance sheet is now at 8.6 trillion. And I think that it could gra uh, gradually start uh, winding that down. And the important thing is gradual movements so as not to have too many shocks in the system. And at the same time, announce a couple of increases in 2022. These are signals that would signal to the markets that the Fed is getting serious about inflation. But the Fed cannot do it alone. I mean, here on the federal government side, which is why I talked about these different bills, uh, we have bills that are encouraging people to stay out of the labor force, giving them family leave time without even a job, free money, basically free money for childcare credits. And there are what we call in the trade skyline taxes. In other words, uh, you reach these different high marginal tax rates at different low uh, levels. So someone might not want to move from 40,000 to 50,000 earnings a year because he might lose his Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, uh, do, do you see what I mean? So the federal government on the one hand is trying to encourage people not to get in the labor force with these bills. And the Fed uh, cannot do it alone. Congress has to tamp down on some of these programs that they're putting out so as to encourage people to get in the labor force and also encourage businesses to invest. We're facing some of the highest tax rates in a very long while if this Build Back Better bill goes through. Jasper, if I could just address parts of that question. Uh, inflation is politically highly unpopular, you know, that people right now, if you survey them, you know, that's really where most of their economic discontent is, is that they're seeing prices rise, their wages shrinking, retirees upset. So from a political point of view, high inflation is certainly going to be a very bad for Biden. But then from the Federal Reserve, what we've got to look at is that inflation is already running, even by their own measure, inflation's running at double the, their target level. So they've got an issue of credibility, you know, that they cannot be seen. And that's really why you're getting a uh, Powell uh, changing course, that he's seeing inflation is getting away from him. And, uh, you know, I just find it uh, rather upsetting that, you know, he's waited till he's been renominated to have a change. Of course, I would have thought he could have at least wait a month before uh, he changes on uh, this. So what I'm saying is that the Fed really is forced to fight inflation, you know, by its own standards, you know, because they really not wanting inflation expectations to become unanchored. And, uh, you know, that you're seeing, already you're seeing inflation expectations rising. Uh, so the Fed really has to slam on the brakes. But as I've said, once they slam on the brakes, they've got a problem with the asset price bubble. I just want to add, I think it's a very good question. And uh, it's not easy to do to slam on the brakes. I worked at the Federal Reserve in the early 1980s when uh, the great Paul Volcker uh, pulled inflation out of the system. But, you know, the stock market was very low then. Uh, housing prices hadn't gone up. The debt was nothing compared to today. You can go on and on down the list today to raise the interest rates. I mean, Desmond's laid it out. It takes a brave Fed to do that. The, they'll do it for a little bit, that's what the markets are calling for. But uh, I, I think the fact is that usually inflation expectations, which I quoted early in my opening remarks, move really slowly. Like, should they move really slowly? Well, I don't know, but they do. And so what happens is these things take a long time to get going. Again, I went to Yale in the 70s when you know inflation here got to 13%. In the UK and Japan, it was over 20%. I mean, imagine that. But it didn't just happen out of the blue. It started gradually at the end of the 60s, moving up. And we like to think they learned that lesson that if it gets up too far, it's hard to bring down. But there's a great temptation 
to look at the kind of numbers that I quoted at the beginning and say, well, no one's worried. But in fact, the, it gets this momentum that can be hard to reverse. Well, uh, it's true, Ken, you can get a 30 year fixed mortgage for around 3% now, just over 3%. So, I mean, it's clear that markets are not allowed. I, I, I'm not sure that I agree, you know, because I think that when you look at the interest rate curve, you've got to look at different parts of the curve. So the fact that 10-year interest rates are low isn't surprising. You know, if you buy my bubble kind of theory that bubbles are going to burst, we're going to have a period of deflation, that makes sense for the further out you go for those interest rates to be well contained. What we're seeing, though, is we're seeing that the near interest rates, those are the ones that are rising. The early part of the curve, one year, two year, three year, they're already now pricing in that they're going to have to be interest rate hikes because there's the inflation. But I don't think that it's illogical for the market to think that what, as soon as you raise the interest rates by a little bit, you get the bubbles bursting and then you get low inflation and then you've got low interest rates on the 10 year rate. The markets don't think the bubble is going to burst. They think the interest rate is going to go up a little bit and big deal. I agree with you. This is an enormous risk, but I mean, if we're asking where the markets are, you know, that there's no question that they're pretty darn sanguine. Yeah, it, 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 can you, you could very well be right. You know, I remember that on the eve of the Eurozone debt crisis, Greek bonds were trading at 18 basis points above German bonds. You know, so they had absolutely no clue that Greece was about to yeah. go belly up. You know, maybe uh, there's something similar here. No, absolutely. I mean, I think people are very sanguine, but. Uh, well, US, anyway, bond yields, US bond yields are negative in real terms right now. Well, uh, maybe I'll pose another question um, and connected to something that Professor Rogoff said, I believe that it's sort of inflation builds up really slowly. It seems like this latest round of inflation that we're in has really caught a lot of central bankers off guard. Um, so what, what lessons do you think uh, central bankers should kind of take away from uh, this kind of particular period that we're in? Um, and also, what, what was it about this kind of combination of factors and, and kind of the COVID moment um, that led a lot of central bankers to either continue to write off inflation, as we're seeing with uh, the ECB and Christine Lagarde, um, or really only come around recently to it? Well, I just had to clarify, I mean, it's the expectations that build up very slowly because inflation's volatile. I have no doubt there'll be some moments where it's coming down. It took, you very rarely just see it soar up. Even if you look at Brazil and countries that have had hyperinflations, it's kind of surprising how it takes time to really get momentum. Because what really gets it going is the prices have gone up. Workers have lost during this period. It's almost incredible that there aren't you know, more strikes and more pushing for higher wages. And you get where the wages start going up, but then that's raising the cost and the prices go up and wages and prices start chasing each other. That's the, the fear that you get into that. And uh, that dynamic takes a while to build up. But, but yeah, the pandemic's a once in a hundred year thing. And we don't know, you know, it, it could be much faster this time. That's certainly possible, but it's not the norm. If we look at the big inflation, even pretty big inflations over the last, certainly over the post-war period. So uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, uh, wage increases are now being built into these union contracts, escalator clauses. So we are seeing uh, that uh, uh, and employers are having to pay more in the labor market. Uh, wages have gone up. In response to the question as to why central bankers didn't see it, first of all, if you're a central banker, you don't really want to be unpopular by raising rates. And I'm sure Ken would know, Ken and Desmond would know more about this because they move more in those circles than I do. But there have been people such as um, 
the monetary economist Alan Meltzer, uh, before he died, he was very, very worried about this. He says something bad is going to happen. Uh, Mickey Levy of Berenberg Bank has been very worried for a long time. So there have been people who have been very worried for a long time. When you're a central banker, you have different pressures on you. Yeah, I, I guess what is really very bothersome about the Fed on inflation is that the Fed seems to have forgotten that the one thing that we know about monetary policy is it operates with long and variable lags. You know, so what the Fed has been doing is it's been saying, we're not going to anticipate the inflation. We're going to wait till we see inflation. When we've actually got inflation, that's when we're going to be starting to act. You know, and that was a huge mistake. You know, that even now, I would say that you know, Jason Furman has characterized it well when he says what the Fed is doing is it's moving now from a very, very, very expansive policy to only a very, very expansive policy. You know, they continue to keep the interest rates at zero. They continue to buy, you know, that they haven't moved to tightening. All that they're doing is that they're not loosening at the same pace as they were uh, before. And I think that that's really a mistake that these central banks are making is not to be anticipating policy, you know, not for them to have been cheerleading the budget expansion and you're know, keeping their policy as loose as they did. You know, I think we're really going to pay very heavily for that. Um, well, I'd also like to know in terms of the global scale here, um, which countries are not struggling with inflation right now? Um, and should we be emulating any of the strategy, st strategies that um, they've been employing? Well, Japan, Japan isn't struggling, but no one's suggesting we emulate Japan. because It has very slow growth. I mean, it's hard to know because I think the United States has had a better recovery uh, than other countries and forget about the stimulus, but uh, we had the access to the vaccines earlier. Uh, frankly, I don't know what the number is, but say half of all Americans have had COVID. Uh, you go to Asia and almost nobody has. So in a, in a sense, the US has sort of blown past this. We're further along. I'm not going to say it's over, but we're further along uh, than many other countries. So they may experience the same thing as they start to open up and uh, start to catch up with the United States. I, I think that's got to be part of it. But the other part of it is the uh, yeah, Diana showed these numbers and Desmond did too. The, the, the stimulus in the US was just much bigger than in other countries. And uh, you know, the, I think the United States uh, accounts for more than 50, half of all advanced country public debt in private markets. And actually the same thing with corporate debt. And we maybe account for 20% of global output. So we've, we've really been, you know, turning up in the spigots in a way. And it's, I, I mean, it's both things. It's not just one thing, but I think there's no question that some of the stimulus we did uh, at the end of 2020 and into March 2021, it, it looked a little too much too late at the time. Larry Summers very boldly spoke out about it, uh, despite people wanting to cancel him, you know, for doing that. And uh, he was right uh, that, you know, they, they, they just wanted to keep going. And, it, and uh, I guess uh, Desmond said that monetary policy operates with long and variable lags. Fiscal policy is faster, but the trouble is the policy gets implemented with long and variable lags. They were doing things eight months after it might have been a good idea. That, that certainly contributed. And it's very easy with 2020 hindsight to say they screwed up. I think that's an overstatement, but it, it you know, definitely wasn't obvious why they didn't do the infrastructure bill first, where at least to the extent it actually is infrastructure, we could debate about that. It's improving long-term growth. It's dribbling out slowly. 
the, what is it, the Build Back, uh, uh, I can't even remember the name of the March one, forgive me. Uh, they were just throwing money at the states whose coffers Mark, were already the, over. Was the American, that was the American Cash Act, yes. it was 1.7 yeah. I mean, trillion. Yeah, I mean, they were throwing money at states which seemed like it would be necessary a, ye a year earlier, but it was already obviously not necessary at that point. They were doing uh, transfers, you know, sending out uh, transfer payments, not just to people most in need, but to practically everybody. And so it, there's no question that uh, there need to be some lessons. And one last thing I said in my opening remarks, there's so much of where they're fighting the last war because they were convinced they didn't do enough after the financial crisis and they didn't want to make that mistake again. That's a different shot. But you wouldn't know that from a lot of the commentary. Well, if Ms. Lockman, if you don't have any uh, anything else to add um, on there, one other question I'd like to ask all of you um, is, you know, what what else in the policymakers toolkit? What what non monetary tools are there that you would like to see considered um, to curb inflation? Yeah, it, it, you know, the inflation is just so widespread, you know, and it's going at a, a rapid pace that one really has to have monetary policy and fiscal policy as being the two main things that handle it. But realistically, fiscal policy is on its own path. You know, you've now got additional spending occurring, so you're not really going to get restraint coming from there as you would like to it. So the burden is being put, you know, fully on monetary policy, but things like, you know, releasing a little bit more oil out of the strategic reserve, you know, that'll perhaps move the oil price for a day or two, you know, it's not really, uh, you know, those are really band-aid solutions it might appear as if uh, uh, you're uh, doing something. I, I should mention something that we haven't spoken about, you know, because that might be uh, important, you know, just in terms of inflation going forward. Uh, it's striking that if there's something, Diana will correct me if I'm wrong, that imputed rent housing is something like a third of the consumer price index. And that hasn't really yet reflected the fact that house prices now are going up by 20%, you know, rents are going up by 9%. So there's a lot of inflation, you know, still that's going to come in the pipeline, you know, from the housing side. But, you know, once again, you know, that is an area where the Fed can do something about it. You know, I, I just don't buy uh, these uh, Mickey Mouse kind of little adjustments, you know, that makes for good politics. But, you know, I don't know that it really addresses the problem. The problem is that we've just got too much demand and too little supply. And, you know, you really have to attack those problems in a serious way. Right, yes, I, uh, I agree with uh, Desmond. And just to add something about the gasoline prices, uh, when the announcement was made about releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that was about one day's worth of oil. And yet at the same time, President Biden has made it uh, big announcements about cutting back on oil and gas production here in the United States. If he wanted to send a signal and also do something about uh, fuel prices, which are different from inflation, fuel prices, oil prices, and gasoline prices are different from inflation. But it, uh, uh, he could uh, reverse that particular policy of his Instead, he's been asking OPEC to produce more oil. Uh, he's been asking all the countries to release oil from their strategic petroleum reserves. And we have so much here in the United States that he has focused on not producing, on keeping in the ground. And the first thing that he did uh, when he was president was uh, end the Keystone XL pipeline, which would have brought more crude down from Canada, our friend, to refine uh, refineries along the Gulf of Mexico to turn into gasoline. So uh, there are small things he could do. This would not affect inflation as a whole. We need the Fed to act for that, but it would uh, 
do something about these oil and gasoline prices? Uh, yeah, let me just add to uh, what uh, Desmond and Diane have said, which is you can go back to the 70s uh, where they really tried everything. So President Nixon put in versions of wage and price controls. Wasn't it uh, President Ford that had the whip inflation now buttons to try yeah. to uh, get everybody to think, think low inflation, just think low inflation, it'll be really good. They tried a lot of things. And it, to be fair, uh, particularly the first measures Nixon did seem to have worked a little bit for a little while. But of course, ultimately, they make things worse because you're distorting prices. And then when they have to go up, they have to go up even more. Then, of course, there's what Argentina has uh, been doing for a long time, or at least, you know, they did under the Kirchner regime. They just lie about their inflation and it's 40 percent, but then governed in numbers, say 10 percent. Uh, hopefully we won't come to that. No, we can't do that here. Uh, BLS would let us. Um, so another another audience member um, is asking if the Fed stops buying Treasury securities, um, are there enough buyers out there to buy all the debt that's being issued? Uh, yes, I I, uh, I would say the answer to that is yes. The amount that the Treasury that uh, the Fed has amassed is uh, along the order of eight point six trillion, if I remember correctly the number, uh, and uh, it should start uh, ending those purchases and then unwinding those sales. Dollar denominated assets are in great demand. The dollar is still the reserve currency. Although I would be interested to hear from Desmond and Ken whether they think crypto is taking over because I've heard from some people that uh, crypto is now looked on in some circles as the new reserve currency. But yes, I think the answer is that there would be enough demand here. I don't know if Ken wants to go. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to speak. Um, so uh, a, there are different kinds of quantitative easing. I just say I had a 2016 book that looked at the past, present, and future of money, and I at least give my opinions there. But I, I think when you're doing just buying government debt, so the Fed prints, basically issues bank reserves, which is a form of government debt and buys up 10 year, 30, 30 year debt, it's really smoke and mirrors. What, why am I saying that? Because the treasury owns the Federal Reserve and the, the, there's a li there's, you're, they're buying the treasury debt, but they're issuing another kind of debt that's basically overnight debt. And uh, Fed funds, the Federal, Federal Reserve, uh, the, uh, that what the Fed uh, is uh, selling its bank reserves is actually they actually pay a higher interest rate than one week treasury debt. I would maintain all quantitative easing is really doing is playing games with the maturity of government debt. In other words, it's taken out the long term debt and putting in the short term debt. And we have we have done that to the point where we are kind of short borrowers compared to the rest of the world. Normally, you like to have a considerable portion of your debt long-term because what if interest rates go against you? I mean, they haven't in a long time, but what if they did? And we positioned ourselves so that if that were to happen because just events we don't understand going on somewhere, uh, we would have to pay so much more uh, in, uh, in payments. Like normally, if you had a lot of long-term borrowing and interest rates go up, it hurts, but you've got all this locked in uh, debt. So um, now I, I, I don't think we'll have a problem. It's an illusion to say how much debt is out there because you've got to count the Federal Reserve debt. The private sector is holding that. And so one substitutes for the other. Uh, so I, I, actually, I actually think that it's smoke and mirrors. What really matters is when they start raising the interest rate. I guess in my view of the world, you know, that if we do get turbulence in global markets, you know, because asset price bubbles are bursting, what we'll see is we'll see a huge amount of money come into the United States and that that money will go into United States treasuries. So 
I don't see a shortage of demand for U.S. Treasuries. You know, in fact, I see the U.S. Treasuries being well bid, the dollar being well bid, if you get a financial market uh, turbulence. So I'm not concerned on that side that we're not going to have enough demand for Treasuries. You know, we'll see interest rates on the long end uh, remaining low. Uh, just as to Diane's question on a cryptocurrency, uh, you know, I think... Uh, uh, to me, that is a real indication that you've got speculation all over the place. You know, it just boggles my mind that Bitcoin now, that market is worth $3 trillion. And, you know, for them to claim that it's a, a, going to be a reserve currency, it's not even a currency, you know, in the sense that, you know, money to have any value uh, needs to have some kind of stability, you know, if it's going to be a medium of exchange or if it's going to be a store of value. And here I'm watching a market that goes from 60,000 to 30,000 in a heartbeat and then goes back to 50,000. You know, this isn't what a reserve currency is. This isn't going to compete uh, with gold. My view is that this is a, uh, you know, just one, another big bubble or another big Ponzi scheme that's not going to have a pretty ending. But then um, I'd I'm like to. Older, I'm from an older generation, you know. That maybe I don't understand something about blockchain. I'd like to also ask all of you, um, perhaps on the flip side, do you see any positive effects of um, the the current sort of inflationary period that we're experiencing? Yeah. <laughs> The positive side is that, you know, when the party's going, it's fun, you know, so, uh, you know, the you get a lot of demand, you know, that people are employed, uh, that so long as the, it goes, you know, near term, it's, you know, like the person who jumped off the Empire State Building, they asked him at the 50th floor, how what were things, you know, and he said, so far, so good, you know, that this is the same thing here, you know, that you're just setting yourself up for a hard landing. Okay, I, 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 I'd say you have to look at, um, we're, we're after the pandemic, uh, we're deep into the pandemic, we didn't know how it was going to go. And so in a sense, doing all this stimulus and the easy money policy was an insurance policy because it could have been, I certainly many economists, you cited, uh, 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 maybe it was Diana, or you did Desmond, cite Jason Furman. Uh, he, would, he thought the world was falling apart in March, 2020, my, my colleague, and I was certainly you know, quite concerned and it didn't. Uh, that was probably thanks to the vaccines more than the stimulus, but had we not had them and who knows what would have happened. So in a sense, you're having to pay the insurance policy here, but okay, that's a justification for doing a lot. But I think it became clear at some point that we had the vaccines, that employment was booming. You know, we, we are in many ways in a red hot labor market and Diana saying how wages are going up. And so, they went on for too long. It was a question of finding an exit strategy. But it, you know, you can't you can't blame them completely for saying we don't know which way things are going to go, and we're you know really worried about a disaster. So you're not going to like it if it turns out okay. And a little bit of our whining at this point about what's going on has to do with that things just went better than anybody thought. So that that's sort of the, the silver lining. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Totally, I'd agree totally with Ken. You know that what they did in March is totally understandable. Uh, I'm talking about March 2020. What they did in March 2021 is yeah. not understandable. You know, you don't throw 1.9 trillion dollars. That's a huge amount of money to throw at an economy that is recovering, that unemployment is already coming down, that you've got very easy uh, monetary policy. You know, that, uh, I, I totally agree with Larry Summers that uh, that has to be the most irresponsible fiscal policy that we've seen in the past 40 years. I don't see anything positive about inflation, but uh, there are people who were very concerned about deflation, especially in 
March 2020, and there are people um, from, for example, the Peterson Institute that said, well, the advantage of this inflation is it gets us further away from the lower bound. In other words, that uh, you, the Fed's target is about 2, 2.5, and that's so we don't get to zero. And so the argument is, OK, well, we're not going to have deflation. That's the argument from those individuals. I don't see anything positive about it, but some people would say that that is the positive side, that we're not going to get deflation. It was something that was worried about. Um, well, on this note about crypto, and perhaps this is more of a question uh, geared towards Professor Rogoff and Mr. Lachman, um, but there's been some talk about the digital dollar, more central banks adopting a digital currency, creating a digital currency. Um, how do you think some of the factors we've discussed today have um, impacted that trend and, and how real do you think that trend really is? Well, I think the trend's very real, like every central bank's looking at it. I don't, I don't know how big a deal it is. I mean, the central bank digital currency is a whole different thing from Bitcoin. Uh, you know, the central bank, the, the, the uh, central bank of China is issuing in the process its own digital currency. And believe me, your transactions are not going to be private on that. And yeah, there's some of the plans for introducing uh, digital central bank digital currencies uh, try to preserve some privacy, but I don't think it has the credibility uh, th that necessarily the cryptocurrencies have. And I'll just say about cryptocurrencies, I would say we're in the first inning of regulation on cryptocurrencies, uh, and we're going we're going to see regulation come down like a ton of bricks eventually because you can't allow these to be used for tax evasion, money laundering, illegal activity. Uh, and, and so I think you're gonna eventually see all the advanced economies ban uh, pseudonymous uh, currencies. I said that in my 2016 book, but what I'll say I got wrong was it might take 30 years you know, before they get around to that. It's a little scary uh, how ignorant they are we hear the uh, mayor elect of New York, you know, talking about paying employees in cryptocurrency, El Salvador, I could go on and on. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think if you ask what is, what are they worth? You could ask that about oil. So eventually we're not going to use oil, but the oil companies are sure worth a lot because for the next many decades, we're going to need it in a transition. And so they're worth a lot. And so, you know, it is a real question of when the regulators are gonna act. Uh, I hesitate to say, I mean, the United States is particularly uh, concerning. Uh, it's very fragmented. There, there are very few sensible things being said. So uh, if it doesn't get regulated, uh, it's, it's gonna keep growing. So the, advan the, the advantages of a digital currency are it's instant clearing and there's a, you can have digital contracts embedded. So as soon as I send you the money, uh, then the contract takes effect. And that's what attracts some people about them. Uh, but uh, as Ken says, there is going to be more regulation coming. And in fact, there was regulation in the infrastructure bill that just passed, some more regulation of cryptocurrency. Um, well, the, the other question that I'd like to ask here, and then maybe we'll move into a few more um, audience questions before we close out, but um, especially relevant as I think we're heading into the, the holiday season here, but obviously the savings rate spiked during COVID and, and we saw a lot of households sitting on cash, um, but consumer sentiment continues to kind of lag a little behind where it was uh, pre-COVID, especially since the, since the summer it's dipped a bit. So I'm wondering um, from all of you, how much you think kind of this pent up demand there is um, and how much of that is really contributing to or driving inflation, um, all of the cash that, that households have been sitting on. Yeah, I think that's really a very good question, you know, and that is basically what's been occurring the last year is that a lot of the money that's been paid out 
hasn't been spent. You know, so when you look at the magnitudes, the estimates are extraordinarily high. We're looking at something like two hundred two over two trillion dollars of excess saving that is pent up demand that could be spent down the road. I would think that that is a risk because if you do get inflation expectations increasing and you've got all of that uh, pent up demand, you know, people, uh, there was a report recently that the average person's uh, bank balance is 50% higher now than it was before the uh, currency, uh, before the, uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, that could really keep demand going uh, for a while. So, you know, that is, uh, that really has to be a risk, you know, on the inflation side that we see that pent up demand. The optimists say that we saw that with the Korean War and that it wasn't uh, spent that quickly. But, you know, I, I think we might be in a different world. Uh, it's a good point about the inflation. Yeah, well, um, household net worth is uh, at record highs and the government transfers have boosted personal income and savings. On the other hand, people don't like inflation. They don't like higher gasoline prices and that makes them worried. And when they're worried, they don't go out and spend as much. They tend to save more when they get concerned. So as we go into the Christmas season, uh, spending seems to be very high, but it might be even higher if there were not uh, if if there was an inflation, if there were not these inflation concerns. Professor Rogoff, did you have anything to add? No, no, that that they that made excellent remarks. Um, I, I'd also like to ask, kind of on another note of, of what, sort of what's driving inflation here. The Biden administration has been issuing a lot of executive orders about minimum wage mandates, trying to get the minimum wage up to fifteen dollars nationally. Um, and for specific subgroups of employees. And I'm wondering how much these minimum wage mandates you think are contributing to inflation? I don't think it's a big deal at the moment. I mean, it's a, they're different issues, but I, that's not the main thing going on here. It's mm -hmm. the massive stimulus, monetary, fiscal, uh, the other things there, there's a whole debate around these things of minimum wages, but I don't think that's the game at the moment. There's Presumably, uh, $15 ain't going to be what $15 used to be pretty soon uh, at these inflation rates. They might have to start talking about a $20 minimum wage. The share of workers who are paid minimum wage is relatively low, and employers are having to pay a lot more to attract the kind of labor and the workers that they need. So that's not an effect. But I even if it were, uh, inflation is, it's a monetary phenomenon. It's caused by monetary, uh, uh, by monetary actions. And I would say that raising the minimum wage would not be inflation. Um, and I guess, Professor Fritzschat Roth, you mentioned uh, all of these transfer payments that have been happening basically since the start of, of the pandemic. I'm wondering really whether you think there's kind of a political future uh, for these transfers, given how you have, I think, reflected on their contribution to inflation. Um, is this something that policymakers should kind of limit from their uh, policy toolkit as much as possible going forward, uh, responding to a crisis? Or might there still be a need for these despite some of the um, you know, inflationary pressures that they seem to have caused. Uh, it, it's very important for us to have a social safety net and it's very important for people who are in need to be able to access payments. Uh, uh, so there is and will continue to be a need for some transfer payments, but just sending out cash without asking for any changes in behavior and thinking that that's going to solve poverty is just not going to work. So take the new, for example, the child credits that have been sent out. They just go to everybody, basically, even if uh, the parents, there's no attempt to help the parents find a job. There's no attempt to see if there's any child abuse, if there's drug abuse, what's going on in the home. So any payments that are sent out by the government to help people 
need to be linked to a certain set of behaviors, which is going to raise these families out of poverty, you know, getting a job, sending the children to school, not being on drugs, uh, those kinds of things. So they need to be more limited. And uh, it's unfortunate that having inflation does not reduce political pressure for transfer payments. That's why I talked about the Build Back Better Act that would have a lot more transfer uh, payments in it. But in general, uh, I don't think that the mood in the country links transfer payments to inflation. That's helpful, if you understand. No, I would say um, the idea of using transfer payments is here to stay. Um, the problem was not what was done in March, you know, the first wave or a couple waves of transfer payments. The problems, they got punch drunk on the success of these. But the, uh, I, I think a lot of economists are sort of calling for a more regularized use of transfer payments. That said, uh, aside from, of course, all the points Diana made, the idea that you just have to give it to everyone to make it politically acceptable is like a little bit inefficient. You want a social safety net, but you don't necessarily, you, you know, you want to hit the lowest, you can pick your number 30%, you know, whatever of the population, but it was, it was going to, uh, you know, for example, let's say you graduated Yale last year and you got some job paying $100,000 a year, you were getting the transfer payment because they were looking at what you had earned the year before and deciding it. So yes, they did that in a hurry, but if there's a plan to do it on a regular basis, which there's a, a lot of intellectual support for, they, they need to prepare for it next time uh, so that they can make it a social safety net and not just raining money over everyone. Mr. Lockman, do you have anything to, to add on? No, I'm very much on that page. You know, I think that that is a problem with the fiscal policy response that was really very inefficient. A whole bunch of people got big amounts of payments who there was no reason uh, to give them, I'm thinking of that PPP program, you know, for businesses that had no intention of letting workers go, you know, they get uh, handouts. It, it just makes no sense at all, you know, that you're really wanting to target it. It should have been a lot better thought out than it was. There's a huge amount of waste and it's problematic. You know, people just seem to be too relaxed about large budget deficits, large debts, you know, that we know that this, uh, well, I, I, I I'm fearful talking in front of Ken Rogoff about uh, countries getting into debt problems. There's something like 800 years of history of that. All the stimulus checks that went out often to people who didn't need it. I mean, some of my children got stimulus checks. They certainly didn't need it. Um, well, yeah, I think that the transfer payment conversation is, is very interesting. Um, I'd like to move into another audience question here. Uh, we have an audience member asking about energy price inflation um, and kind of what the fundamental causes that you all see of, of energy price inflation, which I think has been has kind of come out to be, you know, more of one of the bigger drivers of, of the inflationary pressures we're seeing. So he's wondering in particular about um, the shift to more EV vehicles and also whether investors are kind of paying a premium for 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 ESG and, and how much that that is um, driving the spike in energy prices. Well, if you say you're not going to produce more, if you've been producing a lot of oil and gas and then getting oil from Canada and all of a sudden you say you're not going to produce anymore and we're not going to have offshore leases and we're going to raise royalties and we're going to put federal land um, off limits to oil and gas production, well, then your prices are going to get go up because the United States was a major global producer and exporter of uh, natural gas and refined oil products. So this was uh, a purposeful change by the Biden administration on the production of fossil fuels. And it's not surprising that they went up. 
we do have more blackouts than we used to because of increasing reliance on wind and solar, uh, which are not uh, work very well sometimes, but when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, they don't work uh, as well. So we have been seeing more uh, blackouts. And as far as ESG goes, that's a very complicated subject. That's something that corporations are trying to jump on and I don't think it has an effect on the increase in energy prices. Yeah, just I think on international energy prices, there are a whole bunch of factors playing. You know, you've got to look at, for instance, what OPEC policy is, that there's an issue of a lot of countries that switched from coal. You know, I'm thinking of a country like China that they shut down a lot of their coal production and then they found that they were short of energy, you know, so that that's uh, been a factor. You've got the situation with Russia and what it's doing in Europe, you know, with the natural gas. So there are a whole bunch of uh, factors, uh, you know, that uh, uh, a lot of these markets are monopolistic, you know, that they restrain uh, supply. They're not providing the kind of supply that uh, they should be doing right now. You know, the Biden administration seems to have a lot of difficulty getting OPEC to increase uh, uh, production, which is what OPEC should be doing at these kind of prices. So I, I think it's very complicated, but there are a lot of issues going. Part of it is trying to shift to cleaner energy sources uh, is putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on the energy price. I mean, I would say part of it's the recovery. The, the oil prices and gas prices are very, very cyclical. So you can find this all the time. I, I am concerned. I'm very in favor of having a huge carbon tax, making an energy transition. I think it's one of the most important, maybe the most important problem of our time. However, uh, my impression from speaking to your generation uh, is that people are very uh, climate literate, but not very energy literate of, you know, exactly what would be involved. It's, it, there's going to be a rocky road. We, it's a massive transition. We're going to have shortages. The, yeah, the price of oil is going up. That is the whole idea to discourage people from uh, consuming. Uh, it's really quite challenging. I mean, it's very easy, you know, from, people's air conditioned, uh, or sorry, at this time of year, heated, uh, gas heated or oil heated dorm rooms uh, to be, you know, saying we have to do this. But then, you know, as people are finding out in parts of the world, uh, particularly I could go to Germany at the, at the moment where I think the price of gas went up by a factor of 10 uh, this winter compared to last winter. Uh, this is gonna happen, it's hard to plan. Uh, but I, I don't think that's the biggest thing going on, but it, it's coming. I, and I think we need to think more thoughtfully about the transition. An example being, I, I don't see how you do without natural gas during the transition, which is a heck of a lot better than coal. And the, you know, the idea of let's just use solar and wind and just drop everything else, uh, that, I don't think people will be very happy with that outcome. But uh, yeah, I, I, th I think, again, the climate literacy, I think is wonderful. I'll, going back to my Yale days, I was actually an environmental studies major my first couple of years. Uh, but we also need energy literacy of what is possible. There's also a role to be played for nuclear, uh, which is emissions free and very reliable. And uh, there are now little modular nuclear reactors that can be taken to places in uh, developing countries and then swapped out when they're finished, removed, and then had have another one put in. Uh, we're not talking about nuclear, which would be an emissions-free substitute for natural gas and coal. 70% of French energy uh, was, it relies on nuclear. French electricity, I should say. It's a very good point. Well, I'd like to, I think we have a little bit more time, so I'll, I'll pose a few more questions, but um, I'd like to also ask kind of circling back to where we began with supply chains, which I don't think we've, we've touched on all that much in the past uh, hour and change, um, whether you see any, any quick fixes to the supply chain crisis, which has obviously been impacting port cities all over the world, and whether kind of from the American policymaking perspective, 
there is anything that kind of could be done in the short term to alleviate some of these pressures? Uh, I think that it's, uh, um, it's really interesting that the Port of Miami, Port of Charleston, Port of Savannah, the East Coast ports do not have congestion. They don't have any backups that open 24 seven. Whereas the West Coast ports, Port of LA, Port of Long Beach have massive amounts of congestion. There's very different labor scenarios at these different ports. Uh, they're run under different kinds of union agreements. So there are policy alternatives that one could think of by looking at the labor contracts on the East Coast ports versus the West Coast ports and learning as to how one can operate a port without massive congestion and back. Yeah, it, I'm not sure that you can have uh, short term fixes, but you can have longer term fixes, you know, bringing back a lot of production locally, you know, rather than relying on supply chain. We can have learned a lot from this uh, crisis, you know, that people will, firms will no longer have in time delivery very low inventory. So when you get these disruptions, uh, they're really painful. One thing that we haven't talked about, you know, which has been part of the inflation story, is that we've seen the inflation largely on the good side of the economy rather than the services side. You know, and that's basically because of the uh, pandemic, you know, that as people haven't been able to spend on restaurants or traveling or going out to entertainment, what they've done is instead they've bought goods, you know, and that's part of your supply chain problem is it's not just that you've got problems with uh, chips and stuff of that sort, it's that you've just got far too much demand, our demand has been distorted. So the hope was that we'd soon come back to some sort of more normal pattern of demand between goods and services, but that's where this latest uh, uh, mutation, you know, really raises big questions as to whether that's going to delay that process, you know, and keep the pressure on, you know, which would keep inflation uh, high. You know, the administration and the Fed seem to be betting that you'd get the normalization and that would take off inflation pressure. But, uh, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, whether this uh, new mutation is uh, more transmissible, vaccine resistant, you know, stuff of that sort. But it's just far too early to know. And I, I guess finally here, um, you know, we've touched on kind of the infrastructure bill a bit um, and fiscal policy in general. And, you know, how I think we've all kind of concluded uh, that a loose fiscal policy is not really what the country needs right now to deal with inflation. So I'm wondering, you know, is this just kind of an issue of timing with the infrastructure bill that you see? Or are there kind of fundamental modifications that need to be made to either just limit the amount that we're spending on infrastructure or perhaps restructure uh, how we're spending that money? I, I would just say, I think we can say with some confidence that the bills they're doing now, the infrastructure bill and the social infrastructure bill, whatever you wanna call them, it would have been a lot better to do that first and never do the one they did in March. So the infrastructure bills, you know, you're making this attempt to totally change the size of government but it dribbles out. Uh, let me just say, you know, the advocates, the advocates would say uh, it's going to improve productivity. It's going to, you know, whatever. I don't know, you know, but at least like there's a story about that where it kind of makes sense. Whereas what was done in March, 2021 was uh, really naive. Uh, so they should have done that first. Again, my colleague, Larry Summers said, you know, why aren't you doing this first? And then see how it goes. Do the do the thing that has a big long term benefit, and then you know see what is next. Or maybe you know we can argue about what the benefits are and how much the supply effect is. But uh, I I don't think it if it's a mistake, it's not as serious. It's it's at least you know there's an upside to it. You can tell a story, whereas the other there's an upside to inflation basically, and not so much to the economy. 
Yeah, I, I'd very much agree with uh, Professor Ogoff, you know, that uh, this is very much less of an issue than what occurred previously. Uh, partly because this is going to be spread over 10 years and it's also going to be better financed, you know, so uh, if they need to do anything, it's to make even more sure that we don't run up deficits as a result of this, you know, that the, I think that the CBO is estimating that it's unfunded, you know, to the tune of about $360 billion, uh, you know, but that's not big in relation to the five and a half trillion that we were talking about, uh, about earlier. So I, I, I don't see this infrastructure, uh, you know, it might have some impact, uh, but it doesn't seem to be the big story. It's not, what it's not going to do is it's not going to solve your inflation problem, but it's not going to make it worse. Right. So the infrastructure bill has already passed. Uh, that's about a trillion. It's about 500 billion of new spending. And there's 110 billion for roads and bridges that's given to the different states. And then there's money for other kinds of things, such as 60 billion for broadband and Six, about 66 billion for Amtrak and about another 40 billion for public transit. Uh, and I, I would say that the roads and bridges component is probably uh, uh, worthwhile doing and I'm not quite sure about the other ones. But then you move on to the next bill, which is the Build Back Better bill, which is 1.7 trillion. The infrastructure bill just spent money, but the Build Back Better bill would raise taxes and put in place more incentives for people not to work. So I would say that is definitely a bill that should not pass. And I'm hoping, as I said in my remarks, there's a chance that it might slide into next year. And then as it slides into next year, some of the provisions become obsolete. For example, uh, the, the SALT state and local tax deduction uh, which now is not allowed and it would put back, that becomes less relevant as it gets on to February and March and April because you can't make it retroactive back to January 2021 the way they want to do it. And so I, I, I would say that uh, the infrastructure bill is one thing, the Build Back Better bill, uh, I would say, uh, should not be passed, not just for inflationary reasons, though although it would contribute to inflation by reducing uh, the incentives to work, so it would reduce the supply of labor. All right, well, I think we have to leave it there. Uh, we're at time. It was great to get to talk to all three of you today, and I really appreciate you, you joining us for this conversation. Um, so thank you again to our audience as well for, for, for coming to watch, and there'll be a recording up on YouTube afterwards. Thank you. Thanks right, for thank ranking. Thank you very much.